back uh, so for our second talk uh, this morning. We're happy to have Roman Sauer who's going to tell us about homotopy and homology complexity. Thank you very much. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this beautiful place and for letting me speak. So I will report on joint work with Uri Bada. and Zahik Gelander. So there is a very strong relationship between volume and the topological complexity of uh, non-positively curved manifolds. And maybe the first instance of this phenomenon is the Gauss-Bonnet theorem which uh, relates the volume of your surface to the Euler characteristic. And then um, there is a, in higher dimension, there is a famous theorem by Ballmann, uh, Gromov, Schröder in this uh, famous book, which says the following. Also going into this direction, So it says for every dimension, every dimension d, there is a constant only depending on the dimension, such that whenever you have a manifold of dimension d, Riemannian whose sectional curvature is between minus 1 and 0, and have to be a bit more careful if it's non-compact, so I should say with sectional curvature uh, in a closed subinterval. Um, of minus 1, 0, 0 excluded. So do I have all the right words now for denominational resectional curvature in a closed subinterval? We have that the Betty numbers of this manifold, let's call it M, are bounded by this universal constant times the volume. So here we have the Betty number, the rank of the singular homology. And this holds in any degree k. So now what we do is we uh, will generalize this theorem, but we will measure the size of the homology in a different way. We can also ask not about the size of the free part of the homology, but about the size of the torsion part. And here is the theorem, or the main theorem I want to talk about. So some, some of us have a childish joy in the fact that uh, we have the same initials, <laughs> uh, which is very nice. So the theorem is, well, maybe well, anyway, let, let, let me basically copy the, the assumption for every uh, d. It's almost the same assumption, but there's one difference. We have to exclude dimension 3. There is a constant such that for any d-dimensional Riemannian manifold we 
sectional curvature. Pinch between minus one and zero. We have that the size of the torsion subgroup. So the torsion subgroup is a finite subgroup of the homology. Let me denote it like that. So we can measure its cardinality and the bound is for the logarithm of this, and it's bounded by this universal constant times the volume of m. So basically the same, except that we exclude dimension three, and uh, we say something about the size of the torsion homology. So I should say that this theorem is more general. Uh, they have a statement for non-positive curvature, where they have, in addition, an assumption on so they have to assume that it's a real analytic manifold if it's non-positive, non-positively curved. Um, but this is the statement for this negative curvature. So there is, uh, if you want, a byproduct of the method for proving this theorem. Uh, so instead of asking what is the complexity of the, or what is the size of the homology, you could also uh, ask how many manifolds do we have below a certain volume. And with uh, very similar methods, we can prove the following. Uh, maybe let me introduce a notation to express it more concisely. So let's say um, This is a function of the volume, and p homotopy of v is the number of homotopy types of such manifolds. Let me not repeat the assumptions, but exactly this assumption of the curvature. Homotopy types of such remaining manifolds Uh, whose volume is below V. And similar, you can also ask for the homo homomorphism types and uh, we want to count uh, the number of such manifolds. So here's theorem. Or maybe I should introduce D here, because the dimension is fixed. So let's uh, assume again that D is not free. And then, or let, let's say, well, there is a statement for at least four, and there is a statement for d at least five. Then the number of homotopy types is like that. Or without the logarithm, it's like v to the v. And if D is at least five, then you can say something about the homeomorphism types. So it's, ba it's the same statement. But you have here the homeomorphism types. So the, the thing about dimension at least uh, five is just that uh, there is the positive solution to the Farrell jones conjecture in this uh, range of dimension by Farrell and Jones, and if you have two such manifolds which are homeomorphic, sorry, which are homotopy equivalent, then they are homeomorphic. So counting homotopy types uh, in this range is the same as counting uh, the homotopy types. But again, we have to exclude dimension three. Okay, so basically for the rest of the talk I will uh, 
tell you the, the ideas of, of the theorem, focusing on, on this part, so it's a little bit different, but it's essentially the same methods for, for proving uh, the counting result. Um, the counting result generalizes a result by Oh, let me say this, a result by Burger, Gelander, Moses, Lubotsky. It's, it's the same estimate, um, so, but they uh, only look at hyperbolic manifolds. So in particular, the lower bound you get from this, and you get just from looking at hyperbolic manifolds, um, somehow, what's new is the upper bound, uh, which holds for uh, this variable curvature. Okay, so let me explain for the rest of the talk ideas behind this, um, mainly behind this. So somehow, what you want is you want uh, to find nice representatives of the homotopy types of such a manifold by simplicial complexes. Okay, so Say you have uh, in each homotopy type a nice representative, a nice simplicial complex, and you can control the size of this simplicial complex, the number of vertices, number of edges, number of two faces, and so on. Um, then it's very easy to control the size of the homology. Uh, and if you know that each homotopy type is represented by uh, such a nice simplicial complex, then it's also easy to just count all the possible, uh, well, all the possibilities for such simplicial complexes and get the counting result. So this is what we want. We want general strategy, find nice simplicial representatives of the homotopy types. Representatives. And, well, there's a very uh, classical uh, strategy to do this. This was pioneered by, by Giger and also by, by Gromov, which is you construct nice simplicial complexes, homotopy equivalent to your given manifold, by looking at an open cover and look, looking at the nerve. Simplicial representatives via the nerve construction. So how does this work? Let's uh, look at the somewhat silly case. So because this theorem, both theorems, uh, the main point is that you don't have to assume anything on the interactivity radius. You don't want to assume a lower bound on the injectivity radius, otherwise it becomes almost trivial. Uh, but nevertheless, to, to start this idea, uh, let's assume that we have a lower bound on the injectivity radius of our manifold. So let's just assume that the injectivity radius of the manifold we're looking at is, say, at least one. And then you can construct a nice cover of your space. So Say this is M. So what you could do is you just pick uh, a maximal packing, dense packing by balls of radius, say, 1 over 6, somehow. And then you take the concentric uh, 1 half balls. Well, okay. What you end up with is certainly uh, a cover of your space by these open balls. And since the injectivity radius is uh, at least one, all of these balls, so let me write it here, say one half, all these balls are uh, contractible, even convex. So also the intersections of such balls are convex. OK, so what we end up with is we get an open cover by convex balls, 
let's call it u of m. In such a cover where all the members are contractible and all the intersections uh, well, are either empty or contractible is called a good cover. And there's a classical result in algebraic topology which says your space is homotopy equivalent to the nerve of any good cover. Okay, so let me briefly, I guess most of you know it, but uh, let me briefly uh, recall the notion of nerve. So you have a simplicial complex called the nerve, which uh, somehow measures all the incidences of balls. So the vertex set of the nerve is just given by the balls in the open cover themselves. And then whenever you have two balls intersecting, you have an edge in your simplicial complex. And if you have uh, three balls with a common intersection, you have a two simplex in your nerve. Okay, so this is, this is this nerve construction, and we have this. Now, under this somewhat silly assumption, you can now uh, take this nice simplicial representative and look at its size. So what's the size of this nerve? Well, the bounds are quite easy to establish. I mean, the number of vertices in the nerve is the same as the number of balls in the cover. And since this cover uh, arises from taking a maximal packing by 1 over 6 balls, the number of balls is approximately the volume of the manifold. or let's say it's at least smaller than some universal constant times the volume of the manifold. And to control the size, you also want to look at the degree of vertices. So the degree of a vertex, I claim, is also universally bounded by some constant d. And this is because, I mean, what is the degree you're fixing such an open ball, and you look at all balls that intersect this given ball, um, take, I don't know, the ball of radius 3 around this given ball, it certainly contains all the balls that uh, intersect this ball. So somehow what you have to do is you have to estimate how many balls of radius 1 over 6 fit into, disjointly fit into a ball of radius 3. And... Uh, under this assumptions, curvature bound, there's something called the Bischoff-Gromov uh, inequality that gives you a bound on this, and it tells you that the degree is then universally bounded. And this completely bounds you the size of this simplicial complex, and from that you could very easily uh, get these estimates about the size of the homology. Now, of course, uh, we don't have this assumption, and as I said, the whole point of these uh, theorems is that you don't want to assume something on the injectivity radius. So uh, you have to be uh, more clever. So let's not assume this uh, injectivity radius, but we can somehow isolate the parts of the manifold where the injectivity radius is large and look at the parts where it's small and this is the thin, thick de decomposition that we have for these negatively curved manifolds. So your manifold, I mean, I'm always referring to manifolds under this assumption, looks somehow like this. some fake topology here. Uh, so there is... Okay, so this is a non-compact manifold of finite volume, so you have cusps. I mean, you might not have cusps, but... Uh, if you look at this part, 
deep in the cusps. It can be uh, I mean, there's a deformation retract um, to this part of the manifold. So actually, what I want to look at is what's called the compact core of the manifold. So everything that we have here, okay. can you see the colors? OK. OK, so this is uh, MC, the compact core. Um, the compact core, as I said, is homotopy equivalent to our manifold M. M is the whole, so we might uh, concentrate on the compact core. And then in the compact core, we still have uh, thin components and uh, thick components. So this part is the part where the injectivity radius is small. And here, let's call this M thick. This is where the injectivity radius is bigger than epsilon d, so there is a constant involved here, which is called the Margulis constant in the in this theorem about the thin thick uh, decomposition. And here is the part where the injectivity radius is below this uh, Margulis constant, and I call it m thin. Okay, so in my notation, m thin is just the thin part within the compact core. And let's call the this boundary components that you see here. Let's call it M0. OK, so this is uh, how the manifold looks like. And somehow to push through this naive strategy, at least it gives us a hint um, in which parts of the manifold this strategy might work, namely here. But again, it's not, it's not that easy, as we will see. But OK, before we try to apply this strategy, let's analyze this a bit further. So I want to write this picture as a push-out diagram. So the compact core MC you get by gluing the thin and the thick part along this M0 part. This is a nice push-out diagram. And what can we say about this diagram? Well, we can say something about this part here. So um, the thin part here, its topology is completely analyzed. So what it is, it is a disk bundle um, over circles. So in that case, we're in dimension D. It's a D, D minus bundle or bundles over S1. So homotopically, it's very easy. Homotopically, it's a one-dimensional thing. And uh, this is why this map here is a D minus 2 connected map. So it's an isomorphism of homotopy groups up to a degree d minus 3, and it's an epimorphism in degree d minus 2. And then, since this is a nice diagram, homotopy excision theorem tells you that also this here is d minus 2 uh, connected. And therefore, in this range, the homology of MC, which is the same as the homology of M, is given by the homology of the thick part. Let's uh, yeah, write this down. So if the degree of the homology we're looking at is smaller, uh, or yeah, it's smaller, sorry, it's strictly smaller than d minus 2, then the homology of m is the same that's always the case as the homology of MC, and this is the same as the homology of this part. Now, we prove the following theorem about, and somehow we have a hope to apply this strategy to the thick part. Um, actually, what we prove is the following. 
And this is somehow the main technical theorem in our paper. So the pair of spaces M thick, M0, um, is homotopy equivalent to a, okay, let me write it, uh, C times wall um, D simplicial pair. Okay, I think I forgot to introduce this notion. So I want to say that if I have a, a simplicial complex whose number of vertices is bounded like that and whose uh, vertex degrees are bounded like that, then I want to say so here it, it was applied to the nerve, so we say that the nerve is a C wall M D simplicial complex. Okay, just a so uh, an A B simplicial complex is just a simplicial complex whose number of vertices is bounded by A and whose vertex degrees are bounded by B. So here we have a relative statement. When I say this is homotopy equivalent to simplicial pair like that, what I mean is that M thick is homotopy equivalent to a C vol M D simplicial complex in the sense as before. Um, but more than that, we also have a subcomplex, simplicial subcomplex in this complex, such that we have a homotopy equivalence of pairs like that. So the homotopy equivalence respects the subspaces, also the homotopies. Everything is respected um, or, or descends down to the subspaces. So that's somehow the main technical tool uh, in this whole story. And let me, the subspace, M0, this is the subspace here. Well, here it's just the statement, there is a simplicial complex um, whose number of vertices and whose vertex degrees is bounded like that. And this simplicial complex has some simplicial subcomplex such that this simplicial pair is homotopy equivalent to this pair of spaces. That's, that's the statement. And let me, just to have a catchy name when I refer to this, uh, let me refer to this fact as the simplicial thick, thin decomposition. And uh, let's, oh, there is a, and assuming this theorem for a moment, uh, let's see how it gives us uh, the theorem we want to prove. So this is where we were. We already analyzed the situation somehow here. If the degree, the homology we're looking at is smaller than d minus 2, the homology of m is the homology of m thick. Now, in particular, this theorem says that m thick has a nice simplicial module. And um, if you have this bounds, I mean, I already claimed that, it's, it's, it's not very hard to see that then you can estimate the homology, right? You know this is homotopy equivalent to a nice simplicial complex whose size you can control, and then it's very easy uh, by looking at the simplicial chain complex to bound the homology and also to bound the torsion subgroup of the homology. And uh, let me uh, just, just believe me that if you have this bound on the size of M thick, and you know that HKM is isomorphic to HK of M thick, then you get the bound on the homology. You actually get both bounds, I mean this one here and this one. Okay. So this is somehow okay if you assume this. Um, what about degrees um, greater or equal to d minus 2? Especially d minus 2 is somehow the, the, hard, the hard case. Um, so if k is at least 
minus 2, then d was assumed, uh, I mean, we excluded dimension 3, so let's say this is at least 2. So if it's at least 2, then um, the homology, we start similarly, so hk of m is the same uh, as hk of mc. But now remember what I said, so this uh, thin part, these are just disk bundles over circles, so homotopically uh, this is a one-dimensional object, and therefore if you look at degree at least two, this homology is the same as the relative homology, This is exactly where I want to use that we, that we have uh, k or d at least 4 so that we are looking uh, at degrees at least 2 here. And now, sorry, something a bit confused now. No, not m0, m thin, sorry. Yeah, so I'm looking at the relative homology of this pair here. Okay, and uh, I mean one form to say what is excision in homology is to say if you have a push-out diagram and the relative homology is the same as the relative homology of that, and the isomorphism is given by this map. Okay, so excision tells you that this is the same as HK of M thick M0, and now uh, the relative part, I mean, we already used the absolute part of this theorem here, but now you need the relative part of this theorem, tells you, okay, you have somehow, you can compute this by nice uh, pair of simplicial complexes and get a bound on the homology from the size of the simplicial complex, just as we did it here. And then, uh, without going into the details, this will give you this bound on the size of the torsion homology and also the uh, classical bound on the Betty numbers. Now, we're somehow in the middle of the proof. I mean, we, we understand the strategy, hopefully now. Um, this is kind of black box. I want to say something about this black box uh, later on, but I think now is a good time to uh, analyze where we need this assumption that we exclude dimension three. Okay, of course, somehow we needed it here um, for this argument, but it's not just that you're too stupid or we, we are too stupid to, to do this argument. It's actually a fact of nature that you have to exclude dimension three here. So let's uh, somehow digress from the, from the proof and look at the Example of dimension three. So in dimension three, uh, the thin part, what is it? It is, um, uh, so D is three, so it's a D two bundle. So we were talking about solid, solid tori um, that uh, constitute this thin part. And here's a concrete example where you see where this uh, thin parts arise. So look at the hyperbolic knot complement. Uh, that's not, it's actually not the manifold I want to look at. What I want to look at is um, a closed manifold that arises from M by, by Dehn filling. So what is M? M, you can think of this as the compact core as we had it before and attached um, a torus times zero infinity and this is glued along this, along the boundary, so along the torus. So the, what is the compact core in this specific example? It's like uh, you take a tubular neighborhood of this knot and you take it out. And what you end up is, is a compact manifold whose boundary is a torus. And then you can uh, glue in a solid torus 
to make this a closed manifold, let's call it m alpha, it depends on a parameter. Um, so m alpha is uh, mc, and we clue in solid torus, uh, let's say, along some map f alpha. So f alpha uh, will be a diffeomorphism of uh, the boundary of this. The boundary of this is a torus. to the boundary of MC. So this is a, the infilling. And this is somehow the specific situation that we encounter there in this uh, example of a hyperbolic knot complement. Now, what I want to, the point I want to make is unless in dimension at least four, um, if you want to control the homology here, you care about the maps, right? In this push-out diagram, we didn't care about the maps, how they look like. But now we actually care about how the solid torus is glued in uh, to obtain this manifold M alpha. And the size of the torsion uh, can actually explode if you glue it in the right way. So what is the torsion? I mean, I'm not telling anything new now. It's a classical thing, but it's good to look at this example. Um, yeah, let's look at the torsion. In this case, it is um, H1 we're interested in. So there is no free part in this example. So the torsion is actually just H1. And if you look at the Maya Viatoris sequence, so let me just write it down and abbreviate this. If you look at the Maya via Torres sequence, I mean, you know how this manifold is built from pieces. It is the co-kernel of a map um, from H1 of the torus to H1 of D2 times S1 plus H1 of uh, MC. And how does it look like? Well, let me draw a local picture of the knot. And then there's something complicated. <laughs> okay, so the, the knot or the knot complement, you see here two classes, um, the meridian and the longitude. And you can think of these classes as homology classes, so mu and lambda generate the homology of the boundary, of the boundary torus. And now, if you choose this map F alpha in the correct way, um, this map here looks as follows. I mean, this is uh, C plus uh, Z plus Z, so <clears throat> one comma zero, is mapped to, well, here it's just a set. Here it's mapped to zero. And here it's mapped to, I mean, this, this guy here is generated by mu, or the image of mu. It's easy to see. Um, and however you choose this f alpha, you can make it go to some p, some integer p. And uh, the other basis vector is, well, it's certainly going here to one, um, one and something. I don't care. So if you have this, then put it here. You see that uh, the homology of this M alpha Well, the, let's say the size. Right? You have a map between two abelian groups, three abelian groups. It's rational and isomorphism, this map. 
what is the torsion of the core kernel, easy fact about algebra is that it is the um, absolute value of the determinant of this map. And the determinant of this map here is just P. And of course, you can make it uh, arbitrarily large. And uh, Thurston's theorem about Dean Fillings tells you that, uh, except for finitely many cases, the manifold you obtain from starting with a hyperbolic knot complement is again hyperbolic. And it does not increase the volume. In particular, you can make the, the torsion explode uh, with the same or the same bound on the volume. And it clearly shows that this theorem does not hold. And the, the point of presenting this was to, to show you that the difference uh, to dimension at least four is that you have to care about the attaching map. And that's why uh, it doesn't work in dimension three. OK, so let me finish this example here and uh, go back to the proof. So we're in the proof. We're looking at the thick, thin decomposition. Um, our hope was to, to do this uh, nerve strategy on the thick part. Indeed, the theorem that we prove is uh, confirmation of this. We can actually do it, but it's more subtle. Uh, and I will say something about this. And then from this simple excision or homotopy excision argument, uh, you got the bounds. So now let me, um, in the end, say something about this simplicial uh, thick-thin decomposition and how you prove this. Yeah, so maybe I can erase this now. OK, doing something naive, you could just try to cover your thick part again by balls in a similar fashion as we did before. And uh, so let's zoom in in this picture here. Uh, no. How does it work? Yeah. Let's zoom in. Uh, so let's, I don't know, let's look at this part here with a magnifier. OK, so let's, let, let me draw it again. So you have the thick part. And then you have this boundary component. It's actually a bit misleading in this low dimensional picture. OK, so somehow this is how it looks under the magnifier. OK, there's one difference. I switched left and right. Uh, OK. <laughs> Never mind. OK, so here is somehow this boundary to the thin part. Um, and here is the thick part. And it's actually better to look at this in the universal covering. So let's look at the pre-images of this picture in the universal cover of M, and then the thin part here in the decomposition looks like this. It's a, it's a union <coughs> of convex sets. So it's a union of convex sets um, where the displacement each convex set is of the following type. It's, uh, it's a set of uh, points where the displacement function with respect to some gamma <coughs> in the fundamental group, so gamma is the fundamental group, is small and smaller than the Margulis constant. So again, it's a union of convex sets, so this is somehow a more appropriate picture, and you have corners here. 
Now, if you do it in a completely naive way, you don't get anywhere because, of course, you can cover again your space, the thick part, somehow by balls. But, uh, well, if you do it, somehow like that, and you want to build the nerve, I mean, this, the, the balls or somehow the, the sets in the open cover you're looking at are the intersection of these balls with the thick part. So you get something like this here. And they are not convex anymore. So you, you cannot do the same argument uh, just by saying, okay, this is the part where the injectivity radius is big because somehow you have to look at the intersection, it might not be convex. So you have to do it in a more clever way if you do this simple um, open cover and nerve argument. And, okay, so here is uh, what we do. We give us a little bit of room So starting from here, you have the thick part, but now I'm looking at, okay, so this is again, all this is the thick part, um, but I'm looking at a smaller subset of the thick part, which is the subset where I only look at points which have a distance, say, at least epsilon half to this thin part here. Okay, so there is, a, there is a certain distance here, and I'm looking now at this part, and then what we do is, we do something like that, I mean, you have to, it's not, I mean, you can't, you have to do it in a clever way, uh, it's also not completely arbitrary, but basically, you cover this part here um, in a similar fashion as I did the argument in the beginning by starting with a packing and so on, and then you get a picture like this, so you get all these balls, but of course the balls um, are not confined to this part, they're partly in, in this intermediate area, but it's something like this. And then uh, what you have to show is, well, there is then some orange part, it's just the union of all these balls, and we show that um, the, the thick part, deformation retracts onto this orange stuff. And the orange stuff, just by the way it was constructed, comes with an open covering. I mean, it's defined as the union of open uh, of balls. So it comes with a cover, which is fine. Uh, but what you have to prove is that the thick part, I mean, here I'm in the universal covering, you have to do it equivalently or you do it downstairs. Let's not bother about this, but you have to deformation retract it from here to the orange part, and you also have to do it in a relative fashion to get this theorem. So you have to do it in a way that the boundary um, is mapped to the boundary of the orange part, and so on and so forth. So to do this, um, just one or two minutes, to do this you have to um, define such a deformation retract from everything starting here to this orange part, So this is what you want, such a deformation retract. Okay, because again, let me emphasize this one more, because if you have this, then the thick part is homotopy equivalent to this orange stuff, and the orange stuff is homotopy equivalent to a nice nerve that you can control by the way we constructed it as a union of balls. So how do you get the deformation retract? You get it, um, the tra trajectories of this deformation retract are flow lines, along a certain vector field. And what this vector field should ensure is that it somehow moves you away from the thin part. Okay, so one way to do this naively would be to look at the vector field that somehow points into this direction. You take the gradient of the distance function to this part. And that doesn't work. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's a union of convex sets. It's, it itself, it's not smooth. Um, it's not that easy. But somehow, you want to construct the vector field which 
whose flow lines give you the deformation retract to the orange stuff. Um, such that, okay, so what the vector field should somehow do, it should move you away from the thin part, so you want to ensure that it gives you a direction away from it, and the minimal thing you want to assume that it's in the convex core of the gradients um, of the distance functions. Sorry, let me... Let me introduce this here. This is the distance. Uh, this is a function, and it's the distance to this convex set. Yeah. Okay. Somehow you want to move away from these sets, so you want to have it maybe at least in the convex core of these gradients um, for the gammas that matter somehow for the for the sets that are in the neighborhood or close to this x, and then it will push you away. Well, it's a very vague uh, idea, um, but what you do not want uh, is that somehow the, um, the collection of all these gradients doesn't give you a clue in which direction to move. So a bad situation would be if the gradients look like this, completely wild, distributed in the directions. Because then, well, in that picture, the convex core is everything, and somehow it doesn't give you a definite direction. Um, so what you want to do is you want to control the angles of such um, gradients, of such phi gammas. And you can do this, but what you have to do is you have to work with a modified thin thick decomposition. So the classical one is where you have this Margulis constant. Um, so what we have to do is we have to actually, for each gamma, take a separate epsilon gamma, each smaller than the Margulis constant, and somehow choose in a uh, careful way to somehow ensure that this is not the picture we get, but we actually get a picture like this, that they all have an acute angle to each other. I mean, the ones that matter. And then somehow, okay, admittedly a very vague uh, idea, but then somehow this gives you a, a direction in which to move, and this gives you the deformation retract uh, to the orange stuff. And I finish here. Yeah, I mean, if you assume that uh, uh, in this example, the, the, where is it? Yeah, here, this, this. <laughs> but, no, there, there is just no theorem in dimension three that makes sense in this direction. So in, in dimension three, I mean, no, actually, I... Yeah. Yeah. And you can... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's all wrong in dimension three. And uh, actually, I forgot whether I said it, but let me say it again. <laughs> that um, So the torsion statement is, is wrong in a very strong sense. So um, you can, did I say it? You can upgrade this example so that you get what's called a benjamini schramm uh, convergent sequence of hyperbolic free manifolds, such that if you look at the torsion in H1, the logarithm of the torsion, divided by volume, it goes to infinity. And basically, it goes to any value. So there are other examples by Brock and Dunfield where it goes to zero. So you, you cannot, um, cannot control it. Uh, you can even find this sequence of examples in, in, in a convergent way in some sense, converging to H3. You said something in the beginning about 
saying non-positive curvature? Yeah, so uh, that would, I mean, we, so this theorem, I mean, let's even say locally symmetric spaces of higher rank. It would be fantastic uh, to prove this. Um, so there is some work by, by Zachik. Um, it, it relies on a conjecture by Margulis, but if you have, uh, let's say, uh, a closed manifold, closed locally symmetric manifold of higher rank. Uh, we don't know this estimate. And uh, if you try to somehow imitate a little bit what they do in the non-positive case for real analytic manifolds, it's a kind of induction over a Morse function and you get certain singular sets of lower dimension. But the problem is they might have dimension free. And then you run into this, uh, this example where the torsion explodes. So somehow I don't or we don't yeah, see. Of this example, you did a, you know, a four-dimensional example and took out a tortoise or something, and then tried to do a Dane filling. You would end up with something with some zero curvature. So, I mean, I, you're saying this is this is interesting, but the, conc the other conclusion wouldn't be there either. So. Um, about the counting. Uh-huh. 